When you think of Gothic fragrances, what comes to mind? Something melancholy, morose, something that might make you feel sad, elegiac, funereal, grim. I'd like to share 10 Gothic fragrances, at least the way I perceive them to be. Um, there is something darker about each of them that motivates in me some reflection, wistfulness, melancholy, a bit of sadness. And honestly, there isn't anything wrong with that. For a fragrance to elicit an emotional response, there's a beauty behind that. So let's get started. This is Valeur de Roses. This was composed by Michel Amarac in 1993 for L'Artisan Parfumier. This is much more of a patchouli scent with rose undertones than a rose scent per se. Valeur de Roses is a study in those notes and perfumery that are not meant to be conventionally beautiful, uh, but rather an exposition in those completely devoid of uh, pellucidity and clarity and brightness. There are these visceral scents, loam, mulch, mustiness, decaying wood, haunting cellars and catacombs, shaded with a tender rose and a plum wine. You are greeted with a Damascone heavy rose, but it swiftly gets overshadowed, stolen by the thief, by dank patchouli. And this thief patchouli has this kicking and squirming rose and an oversized knapsack, and the wafts appear and they recede as the scene darkens. And this abduction of the rose, while unsettling, exalts this damp, camphorous patchouli in a manner I haven't really encountered elsewhere in fragrance. Um, it's almost as if I found this kind of patchouli I've been looking for um, while I was on a mission for a rose um, with no cacao elements, with only this wistful plum sweetness hovering over the damp, sullen forest understory. I mean, this is no unwearable miasma, though. It is ever captivating and addictive to my nose. It is definitely an occasion fragrance, uh, not for everyday wear. Um, this wouldn't fly at a celebratory fun occasion. It is far too elegiac to be worn at times of quiet reflection, to be worn for oneself and among the right company. Who can appreciate such off-center creations? More for fans of Monk than Monet. <laughs> Next we have Narciso Rodriguez for him. Um, this was composed by Francis Kirkjan in 2007. And I read somewhere that this reminded someone of a graveyard picnic after the rain. Now imagine that. That is a scene to consider. It really does uh, paint a picture. It's pensive, brooding, yet it's also mysteriously sexy. The violet leaf is the standout note. It's green, vegetal, and cool. It somehow reminds me of when hiking and I encounter a stream. Um, there is that scent of wet rocks by a stream near a waterfall covered with damp moss. And there's this mildly ozonic um, element that contributes to that negative ion sensation that I'm convinced that I detect when I'm running, when I'm by running water. And I detect it here. It's pretty magical. But it's a cloudy day when I smell this. Cloudy, misty. And there's this beauty. 
This was released over 100 years ago, 1906, Jacques Guerlain. This is an experiential fragrance. It is an atmosphere, an ambience. It was never meant as a vehicle for grabbing attention and making a grandiose statement. And I can't speak for previous formulations, and therefore I cannot pine over how much more beautiful it may have once been. However, with just this bottle, it's just more than beautiful enough for me. And moreover, despite other individuals' gripes, the base lasts on my skin for several hours. I consider myself lucky. I, um, as I apply this to my skin, my emotions are awash with nostalgia, distant echoes of the past. I'm reminded of those moments in life where you, you just come to terms. Grief, impermanence, passages of time that shape and age and cause all that is vibrant to fade one day. And this may all sound depressing to those who resist bluer feelings, but for those who embrace them as the fulcrum of life's rich pageant, they drive us to uh, appreciate the joy that we know inevitably comes and goes. It's not permanent. And we, we have visual art and film that reminds us of this, and those can nourish our soul, so why not a fragrance? Uh, there are only a handful that come to mind, and, and Alfred Lundé is, is one of them. The many melancholic shades conveyed by the assemblage of iris, violet, heliotrope, and mimosa as they sing a solemn, sweet chorus, the volume fades ever so slowly and lulls you. It's as if the dry down was imbued with raindrops slowly evaporating on spring flowers. Next we have Giacomo de Giacomo, O Cendere, which was released in 1970, composed by Jean-Claude Astier, who is known these days for his many uh, contributions to M. Mikulif and Widian. I, I imagine a sexy, sexy, <laughs> sexy seventies Gothic. Now, Gothic culture, it's argued as to whether or not it existed before the eighties. Um, so this is, uh, <laughs> BJD before joy division. Um, <laughs> Uh, long before Cocteau Twins and Dead Can Dance and Bauhaus. Um, but for some reason, I imagine that somebody who has had that type of temperament in that time period, a male or female, um, let's keep it open, um, who would perhaps appreciate a, a certain style, a certain aesthetic, maybe merging the mid-century modern style, Scandinavian design, earth tones, clean lines, but darker hues dar or darker shades, um, a little bit more contemplative. So I've just imagined this gentleman sitting there, maybe watching some mediocre television, and then Courtship of Eddie's father comes up and his, his face lights up. And I smell what I, you know, the equivalent of what I hear is sort of the interstitial music of the show, uh, a Celeste, some bells, some chimes. So this opens with a muted citrus and it already bears forth this musky, spicy, floral melange, um, this dignified masculinity that had yet to be this balls out swagger um, that would surface a mere five or six later. Um, but there's a foreshadowing of it in the dry down. But what makes this a little bit darker is the clovey carnation and just sort of this mythical machismo undercurrent that seems more reflective and pensive, um, than something bright and winsome. Um, 
it just feels a little bit more reflective than the fragrances of its time. If equipage was somebody who is really uh, eternally hopeful and sunny, this would be sort of the contrast to that. Uh, oh, Sondre by Giacomo. Long discontinued, um, sadly. Next is Check and Speak, number 88. I have the EDT and I have the EDP. This was originally released in 1980 with the EDP um, following much later. In fact, just recently in 2021. Uh, the original was composed by Jean Steven, known today for his contributions uh, with uh, towards uh, Bodicea the Victorious, Naughton and Wilson. Shout out. Um, this is a chilly, rainy, gray morning. Something I reach for during those uh, conditions. It was like that this morning, in fact. Um, it sprays on deep, dark, and delicious. It's dense, it's brooding. Um, there's this rose with a somewhat sharp and minty geranium immediately greeting you after the top notes. Um, and there's a bergamot just lifting enough so it's not you know, it's complete vortex, um, and it's enchanting. Um, there is this refined, soapy and earthy contrast, this, this distinct note of black locust blossoms in full bloom, which is interesting. Um, I don't know if that's in the note pyramid, but um, if you're familiar with black locust trees, um, there are these hanging flowers that are only in bloom for a short time in late spring, and they smell um, vaguely orange blossom-like, uh, conquered grape, um, but not quite as bright. They're a little bit, uh, a little bit richer. Um, so yeah, this is sort of the kind of fragrance that would match shoegazer music, <laughs> slow dive or ride or lush or. My Bloody Valentine. <laughs> um, and over time, as it dries down, there's this dusty, wistful vibe. Um, the sandalwood and the vetiver becomes more pronounced. But the rose, geranium, and the florals, they linger. They have not evap evaporated. Um, and there's a reassuring persistence to it. Um, but the only difference being that they have a bit more of an incense-like quality. It's, it's overall, it's impressionistic and haunting. Let's say the difference between... The EDT and the EDP is that the geranium and rose are much thicker here. And so it's argued that this is closer to the original than this, but I like that this is a somewhat lighter version of it. So it suits two, two aspects, you know, similar moods, but not quite the same. Uh, and um, I love having both. Um, it's a... Uh, Number 88 is a, is, is a wonderful scent. And then we move on to GOF Trumper. Uh, this is Eucharist. Allegedly, the EDT was released in 1912. Um, the EDP um, was released not very long ago, and much like with number 88, some uh, claim that the EDP is closer to what the EDT had been some time ago. Now, this is melancholy, brooding, contemplative. There's a density to the spices, a moss. There's this juiciness to the black currant that's in this. Um, really complements this overcast weather feel. And below it all is this ground cover of lily of the valley and raindrops opening their balm in the humid air gray skies, a man who's seen a lot, has many tales to tell, wisdom, experience. So as you can imagine, it's probably not a clubbing or date night scent. <laughs> I can almost hear distant Westminster quarters through the rain when I get laughs of this. It's introspective. It's majestic. Oh, sweet sorrow. It's Beaufort London Fathom V. Ah, 
This one's from 2016, and um, this embodies the tenderest catharsis of grief in a bottle. And what might you ask would enable a fragrance to do that? <laughs> And moreover, why would someone want to be reminded of grief? Well, it's an inescapable part of life. Beauty and unconditional love, it's born out of grief. It is the contrast that makes joy shine and without it, experience is flat. Fathom V is bereavement green. This is the green that is still detected during the waning autumn, chrysanthemums just before they ripen and wilt, leaves as they decay, or it could be the very earliest thaw as spring commences, the smell of warming earth, crocuses and snowdrops, life unfurling from dormancy and the first bees retreating from their hives, death, birth, darkness, light. The most pronounced notes um, are this, it's, there's this raw, vegetal, stemmy, somewhat bitter green, the smell of funeral flowers and uh, the soil from which everything grows from and decays into. And there's this mimosa note uh, in ginger that manages to prevent the experience from being so morose uh, as to be hard to stomach. And uh, cumin, is in the background and that imports and imparts sort of a, a warm soul to temper the cold and the melancholy. An aqueous element seals it all. While in the drown dry down you have this like salty, rooty, somewhat metallic base, and that's impermanence. It's the only content um, only constant. So yeah, there you have it, Fountain V. Van Cleef and Arpels Param, 1978. Um, this was composed by the elusive Louis Monet. I have very, I've been able to locate very little information on him, um, but I would like to do more research and see what else he has contributed. Um, this is a great dark man in the shadows. He has a carnation boot near. Could he be Dracula? Hmm. This is one of my faves of that time period. It's a confluence of all that I love dearly in fragrance. Rose and leather and patchouli and herbs, spices. Um, and the whole is much, much greater than the sum of its parts. Um, when this is unleashed in my skin, I, I feel like an aristocrat entering this dark fable escaping the tawdry and mundane, and uh, my imagination is free. And there is this significant luxury, sort of luxury rose soap element to it, but that to me is what makes it so ravishing. It's these aliphatic aldehydes that exalt everything, and uh, that includes this base in the dry down. It's incense base. It's mythical and opulent, like some great dark. Bearded irises of all types. And they not only have a smell in their root, but they give off a certain smell in the flower. So it isn't necessarily true that irises, the flowers, don't have a scent. Sometimes varieties do, like bearded irises. So this always reminds me of that smell when you put your nose into a bearded iris at the very top. Um, ooh, where do I even begin with Iris Silver Mist? So, composed by Maurice Roussel, 1994. So, this is almost 30 years old, remarkably. This uh, also kind of uh, gives me that vibe that Oris Butter does of that freshly printed, minted paper money, like cash. And, you know, speaking of cash, uh, this is pricey. 
Um, but it is just so staggeringly beautiful. Um, but it's worth a sample just to experience how otherworldly, steely, and pensive uh, Irish Silver Mist is. It's another example of a fragrance that I call experiential. Um, it's a sacrament for those who want to eat, drink, and sleep Iris. <laughs> and it's rumored that Roussel actually used every Iris material at his disposable, natural and synthetic, to compose Iris Silver Mist. So like layer uh, after layer of irons, ionones, Irival, Oramone, Oris Butter, Oris Absolute, you know, <laughs> so on and so forth. And there's a little bit of galbanum that lifts these dense iris folds, and uh, it lends this fresh green quality um, to uh, what is otherwise something very cool and steely and gothic. So I also get that sensation of the smell of leaves in an herb garden after a heavy rain, like basil, catnip, lovage, um, wet stones that border the garden, a chill in the air, the flowers shudder, there's a trembling blueness. It really responds to my introverted side. It's a beauty. And lastly, Pascal Morabito Black, composed by Jean-Louis Suzak in 1981. The opening is this peculiar, saturnine, yet darkly gorgeous, anisic, violet-like sensation with this peppery, leathery undertone to it. It kind of reminds me of something out of like a David Cronenberg movie, like futuristic and sly and stealth and steely. Uh, the leather intensifies in the heart with these elements of aromatics and resins and furling. And there is this soapy yet unctuous element to it, which would give it its appeal for those manly men of the day. But this was not your typical fragrance. They broke the mold, or rather, Suzak. Suzak broke the mold when he created Or Black. And I think that I would argue that this was um, an influence uh, to Fahrenheit um, in some ways, because there is sort of this petrol element, a trace of it, not as much as in Fahrenheit, but a hint, a hint of elbow grease. This is more nuanced um, than Fahrenheit, but it's just remarkable. Um, it dries into this slinking balsamic kind of presence and this bone dry oak moss. So alert to oak moss lovers. It's like putting your nose close to like a lichen covered tree. It's wild, absolutely wild and beautiful. So there you have it. They are 10 of what I consider gothic fragrances. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button for further notifications. And um, let me know of some fragrances that you enjoy that you would put under the category of gothic. I would love to hear. And next week, I'm going to present an adjacent topic, liturgical fragrances. So stay tuned for that. And I want everybody to take care.